Mathematics is a huge field, but there are some major ideas that reappear in all sorts of different areas of mathematics. And so I wanted to start a new video series talking about some of these major themes within mathematics. And this video is going to be about mathematical invariance. I'll explain what an invariant is and show you a bunch of different examples from different disciplines within mathematics. To introduce the idea, I'm gonna use an example that comes to us from graph theory. This is a graph that consists of a bunch of vertices and a bunch of edges connecting them. This is one graph happens to have eight vertices and 12 edges. And here is a different graph that, well, also has eight vertices and 12 edges. So the category of objects that we're working with here are these kinds of graphs. But now the question is, are the two graphs that I've shown you the same graph or are they different graphs? For example, if I show you this with an animation now, you can see how the one graph transforms into the other, and I indeed can transform back. That is, it's not just that they have eight vertices and 12 edges, the relationship between the vertices are the same in the two graphs. This is what I refer to as a graph isomorphism, and to a graph theorist, these two graphs are indistinguishable. There are different ways to write them on the page, but they reflect the same relationship between vertices and edges, and so to a graph theorist, they're the same. But because they look so visually different, the problem of taking two graphs and deciding are they the same graph or are they different is actually kind of challenging. So I wanna come up with a way to help me distinguish between different graphs. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a, another one, a, a very beautiful looking one. And this time, I'm gonna be a little bit more careful with my coloring. In fact, I actually can color the vertices in a special way using only three colors, blue, green, and pink. And if you look at this graph, every edge has two different colors at the end of it. There, there's nowhere on here where you have like green connected to a green. It's always different colors. This is referred to as a coloring of this graph, and because there's three colors, we'll call it a three coloring. I could have colored this with more colors, but I actually couldn't use less. I couldn't do, for instance, two. For example, if I focus on this loop here, and let's imagine I only had two colors to work with, so I'm gonna go around the loop. I got a blue, then I got a green, then a blue, then a green, then a blue, and that causes a problem. Now I've got an edge that has a blue on both sides. So I cannot color this, with only two colors, I have to color it with three. So the name that I'm gonna give for this is that I have something called the chromatic number, and it is just the smallest number of colors that I needed to color the graph under this condition that no edge has the same color on opposite ends of the edge. Here's one more example of a graph. This is a complete graph on five vertices, and what that means is that every single vertex is connected to every other vertex. And as a result of that, if I wanna color it so that every edge has distinct colors, every vertex must have a distinct color. So in this case, the chromatic number is five. Okay, so let's now explore the idea of an invariant. I claim that chromatic number is a so-called mathematical invariant. And what I mean by this is there is a way that we have taken a class of mathematical objects, namely graphs, and associated to that this, well, it's an algebraic object. It's a number, it's the chromatic number. So given a graph, it associates this chromatic number. And the great thing is that if you have a graph isomorphism, then the chromatic number does not change. It is so-called an invariant. It is invariant under these graph isomorphisms. And so this gives us an easy test. If two graphs have different chromatic numbers, then there cannot be a graph isomorphism between them. One of the most famous theorems in graph theory is the four color theorem. And it says, well, let's take a map like, this is a map of the United States here. And a map like this, I want you to think of as really a graph. For every state, you can imagine it being a vertex. And then there's an edge between two vertices if the two states are geographically connected on the map. And we're gonna be looking specifically at so-called planar graphs, ones where you can draw everything out on a plane. So then the four color theorem gives us an upper bound on what the chromatic number is. It says that no matter what you do, the chromatic number is less than or equal to four. Maybe you can do better than that, but no matter how complicated you make your map, you can always color it with four colors as is illustrated in this particular example. I had the word loopless here because if there was an edge that goes from a vertex around to itself, that it would be impossible to color it with any number of colors. So in that graph theory example, we saw how this 
mathematical objects of graphs were associated with the specific number, which was chromatic number. But broadly speaking, an invariant is just when you have a mathematical object or a class of mathematical objects, and you, you have some property where that property doesn't change when you make various transformations. In the context of graphs, the transformations we were considering were graph isomorphisms. But let me show you a new example and a new invariant in a new context. And now we're going to go to geometry. This here is a, a cube. I, I don't mean it to look like a graph. It, it's now a, a geometric cube. A cube consists of a few different things. So first of all, it's got vertices, eight vertices. Second of all, it's got a bunch of edges. We've got 12 edges. And then finally, we have faces, the six faces of a cube. So sort of associated to the specific way that I drew my cube, I have these three numbers, 8, 12, and 6. Then I'm going to create something new. This is called the Euler characteristic. And basically what you do is you take the number of vertices, subtract the number of edges, add the number of faces. If there was higher numbers of dimensions, you keep on with this subtracting, adding, subtracting, adding pattern. And in our case, with 8 minus 12 plus 6, we get the value of 2. So again, we're taking a mathematical object now. It's a geometric one of this cube. And we're associating to it a number, this Euler characteristic of 2. But what I really want to illustrate is, is that I change how I represent this mathematical object. The Euler characteristic is not going to change. For instance, let me suppose I came along the uh, top and put an extra edge in. It's still a cube, it's just my choice of representing it with vertices and edges as faces has changed. The, the object is itself still a cube. But now I have one more edge and the top face is being split in two, so I have one more face. But 8 minus 13 plus 7 is also the value of 2. And if I put a whole bunch of different little edges in, you know, I, I represent it in a different way. This one is sort of triangulated. Okay, well now I have 8 minus 18 plus 12, it's also 2. So this invariant is not changing as I change the way I represent this cube. In fact, it's even worked. If I take any of the five platonic solids, because it's just they're particularly pretty, uh, you can do many more than these. But if I take any of those, if you sat down and count the number of edges and vertices and faces, all of them have Euler characteristic 2, are in effect a two-dimensional surface which goes around a single hole in the middle. It's actually just sort of equivalent to a basketball, which, by the way, also has Euler characteristic of 2. In the field of topology, we study objects as if they're made out of Play-Doh, where we're allowed to stretch them and move them around, as long as we don't do any ripping or tearing or smashing together to get rid of the hole in the middle. You can take a, you know, a coffee cup, something that just has a single hole in the handle, and deform it into being a donut, something that has a single hole in the middle. And the big theorem about Euler characteristics is that they are an invariant, that when you make these kinds of transformations, which we need to be precise about and prove about at some point, but nevertheless, it does not change the Euler characteristic. Let's actually look at a donut or a torus as its fancy name is. And you'll notice here that I've shaded in a vertex, a couple of edges, and then I have a face that wraps around the donut in the mesh that I've put up here. And the way I want you to think about this is that if I start with a square, and I can use the square and transform it into a torus. So first what I do is I take two of the parallel edges and I wrap them together to make a cylinder. And then I take that cylinder and wrap it around to make a torus. And so I get this kind of association. They're a rectangle with, say, the two verticals being glued and then the two horizontals being glued. That's going to give me a torus. So my four edges of the square really just become two edges after gluing the sides together. There's one face and there's one vertex. I mean, it looks like there's four vertices on the square, but they're all glued together. So there's only one vertex. Figure out the Euler characteristic of that. One, two, one, we get an Euler characteristic of zero. So the big idea now is if I compare this torus with like a cube or a sphere, because their Euler characteristics are different, there isn't some bizarre transformation that allows us to take one into the other. Because this Euler characteristic is an invariant, we can distinguish between these two different objects. My next example of an invariant comes from linear algebra, which is actually a field that has a huge number of invariants in its study. This is a linear transformation, which means that it takes straight lines and maps them to other straight lines. The linear transformation corresponds to a matrix, 
five quarters, three quarters, three quarters, and five quarters. And looking at this transformation one more time, I focused on the unit square, which is area one, and under the transformation, well, it turns into this weird rhombus, but if you carefully do some geometry on it, that also has area one. That stretching factor on the area is a geometric invariant called the determinant. When you start with the unit square, the resulting area, well, technically it is the signed area with a plus or a minus, well, this gives the determinant. And in our case, we have a stretching factor on the area of one, so our determinant is one. And the output of this looks a little weird in part because the grid lines that I initially plotted parallel to the x and y axis have little to do with the transformation. But if I visualize this instead with these more diagonal grid lines and then consider this new region, well, the transformation is much nicer. In one direction, it stretches by a factor of just two, and in the other, it compresses by a factor of a half. For those who know things about linear algebra, that's because I've chosen eigenvectors to be my grid lines, and I'll put up here a link to a video explaining that part of the story. Now, that matrix, five quarters, three quarters, three quarters, five quarters, you can actually do a bit of algebra to check that it can be written as the product of three different matrices, which can be thought of as like the composition of doing one transformation, then another transformation, and then another. And what's particularly relevant here is this middle one, which is the diagonal matrix. And this diagonal matrix is particularly important because right there on the diagonal, you see those two stretching factors, the multiplication by two and the multiplication by one half. The way I came up with these matrices was using eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I, again, I'll, I'll link an introduction to that if you're interested, but from our purposes, what I just want to note here is that the stretching factors we really care about have appeared in this decomposition. The names of the other two matrices, by the way, are typically P and P inverse. And I think about both of these matrices as changing the coordinate system. You change the coordinate system and then you change it back with the inverse. Let's understand this visually. If we start with the square form from the diagonal grid lines, the first matrix rotates the grid lines to the normal horizontal and vertical axes. Now we apply the diagonal matrix where it's really nice. It's just stretching horizontally by two, compressing vertically by a half. And that relationship is a little more obvious now that we're in this more convenient coordinate system. And then finally we change our grid lines back and we get to the output we saw before. Algebraically, we can compute out determinants as well. They have both a geometric and an algebraic meaning. And you might have seen this formula before. If you want to take the determinant of a matrix like five quarters, three quarters, three quarters, five quarters, what you do is you take the main diagonal, multiply them together, subtract off the off diagonal, and you get this result, which in our case turns out to be one. And if you take the diagonal matrix instead, do the same thing, main diagonal minus the off diagonal, you get, well, once again, one. And all of this is just a long way of saying that the determinant, whether I think of it algebraically or whether I think about it geometrically, is an invariant. When I change the coordinate system, when I change from my original matrix to this diagonal matrix, the determinant does not change. Ultimately, we've seen now a couple examples of invariants, but there are so many more throughout mathematics that invariants really form one of the major themes of mathematics. I actually believe that as a student, it's really beneficial to have exposure to a wide range of topics within mathematics to help see some of these connections. And that's why I am so proud that this video is sponsored by brilliant.org. Brilliant has thousands of lessons in math, science, and computer science. And as an advocate of active learning in my own classrooms, I really appreciate just how interactive Brilliant's lessons are. You get to manipulate the mathematical objects and the data. You get to assess your understanding and get feedback if you screw up. Brilliant's lessons are built up in layers of complexity so that you can understand every step along the way. As a professor, I know that this kind of student-centered and engaged learning is just really effective for your learning. And that's why I'm so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. So go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazet or click the link down in the description to try everything that Brilliant has for free for a full 30 days or get an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. And with that said and done, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.